Good morning, St. Andrews. My name is Jane Rideout, and it's good to be worshiping with you today, whether you are online or you are here in the building. It is an honor and a privilege to, to worship together today. Um, as I said, my name is Jane Rideout. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at St. Andrews, along with my husband, Gary, who will be bringing the message today. And um, we're just so happy you're here. I do want to give a quick um, shout out to our those online. Today is Communion Sunday, so you're going to want to make sure you have something for later in the service when we take communion together, some sort of bread or juice, something like that, that you could use from your house and join us in this important sacrament. All right, I got a bunch of announcements for you. The most important for those in the building right here, be sure to grab your booklet. This is our Lenten booklet and our journey together. In it, um, you'll see a lot of the stuff that you would see online. So it's always available online. But in here, you've got your reading schedule of the book of Luke. Um, you'll have ways to serve. You really need to take time because there's four families to serve together as well as individuals. Ways to give or supporting Dover Elementary. There's all kinds of important information and even ways to have fellowship with each other. And so be sure to take this, take some time and look at it. And of course, this week we are have two yoga classes being offered. It's called Yoga Church. If you haven't tried it out yet, it is amazing. It's on Wednesday and um, Saturday morning as well. And you just have to go on anything to S-A-U-M-C Life to register. Um, one particular thing, we have a serve day this coming Saturday. It is from 9 to 12, and really anybody can do it. Just come that day, but you need to register for it. So this is a great time of year to be out working. It's not gotten brutally hot yet, and we're going to spruce up the campus, and you're going to meet people, and we'll have some food for you, and it will be a glorious morning. So this coming Saturday, again, you want to sign up or register at S-A-U-M-C dot life. All right, so some of you have noticed, I see you're wearing name tags. Thank you. What we are doing is we are saying masks are optional. You do what you feel most safe. But if you're comfortable, you can take them off totally. And we're also saying put on a name tag. We want everybody to do that because we want to start learning each other's names. We've spent two years not being sure what people's names are. And so we really want to learn everyone's names. So thank you for those who saw that. And each week we'll do the same thing, giving you opportunities to start meeting people. Um, I think I may have hit everything. Um, as I said, I'm really excited that we get to worship today. So let's go ahead and begin our time. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited about this name tag thing because when I started here, everybody had masks on. So getting to know people and put a name with, literally put a name with a face. I forgot mine. My name's David. Um, sorry. <laughs> I do think it's a really cool idea, though. So, uh, why don't you stand up and join with us this morning? Uh, we're going to just open up with a few songs, and the service is going to be a little bit different. As you'll notice as we go through, we have some cool things happening. We have uh, baptisms, as I believe Jane said, and that's always a reason to celebrate. But uh, let's just start out this morning uh, lifting up God for who he is and his greatness. Like you, 
That's a good thing, right? I always feel like when we're singing that song, we're kind of bragging. It's like, like I always picture, maybe it's because I have little kids, but I always picture being on the playground, being like, my daddy can beat up your daddy. I don't know where that southern accent just came from. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is what we're saying. It's like, no, no, God is real and God is powerful and we're following him. And that's why we're going to sing this next song about uh, building his kingdom here because he chooses to work through us. Uh, when we live in submission to him. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls, Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your peace. Build 
those hands again. We gotta wake up. Unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far. You know who's coming. No force of hell can stop. Your beauty changing hearts. You made us far much more than this. Awake. you guys know it's okay to have a good time while we're worshiping God okay he calls himself our father I mean he calls he relates himself in many different ways sometimes as like a mother as well but but think about if you're a parent like either one of those things and your kid comes to you and he's like over there playing and having a good time and then he walks up to you he's like dad like, yeah will you play with me no, <laughs> you're being really boring right now. Like I want the, like the energy, the fun. Like I, I love seeing my kids like get passionate about something and I feel like that's how God is with us. So we don't, I just want to let everybody know you don't just have to stand there silently because we're in church, okay? All right, however you worship best, that's the way that we want you to uh, worship here at St. Andrews. So let's sing this next song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace As long as life 
morning uh, we are going to do things a little bit differently and uh, we're going to take time now to observe communion and you know scripture says that we should take time out to reflect on ourselves before we do that that's something I feel like we don't get a lot of time to do normally because we're all so busy and we fill our time with you know looking at a phone or having something on and during this time, though, what we're supposed to reflect on is where we are with God and where we are with other people. So how we are treating other people directly influences where we are with God. There's no just me and God are okay when it comes to our faith. It's if you and God are okay, that means that you are loving other people and serving other people in a selfless manner. So that's what we're supposed to reflect on now because the act of communion, we're taking well, we're taking a bunch of really terrible tasting little pre-wrapped cups because of, you know, the sickness is going around, but we're taking part symbolically still in one piece of bread that's broken up and given to other people. And so that's, you know, the act of unity is what that's supposed to represent, unity with each other, unity with Christ. So if we're doing anything that is causing division or causing disunity with somebody else, then we need to make that right. And so that's what we're gonna take time to think about those things and to reflect and to pray. And we're gonna give you about 60 seconds, which is a lot longer than any of us ever sit in silence. We're just gonna play some background music for you if you would like to bow your head and take a moment uh, to reflect as we're about to observe the sacrifice of Christ. sung about this amazing grace now we're going to experience it in ways that are simple yet very powerful something that Jesus told us to do 
like he's speaking to each one of us, do this in remembrance of me. But it's not just for our sake, as, as David said, it's for the sake of others. We take, the, we take the grace that we've given to us, the redemption we've been given to us, and share with others. So those at home, you need to gather your bread and your juice together. And if there's anybody in here in the sanctuary that did not get one of these, uh, raise your hand and hopefully somebody will come by and bring you one. So, you got one? Okay. On the night in which Jesus was taken up on the cross, he gathered with his disciples, his good friends, and in the midst of this minor, uh, dinner, this meal, he grabbed the bread, he broke the bread, gave thanks to God, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after the supper, he took the cup, again gave thanks to God, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of bread and juice. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one in Christ, one in you, and one in ministry to all the church and to all the world. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're here in a sanctuary, take the cup. Some of you have already done that. I see you're already chewing. But that's okay. That's okay. We'll give you forgiveness. At home, grab the bread. Here, peel off the, the first layer, and you'll see a little wafer there. Hold it up when you have it. This is the body of Christ given for you at home take the bread if you're here in the sanctuary peel off the next layer you'll see the juice those at home grab the juice here if you everybody if you get it hold it up this is the blood of Christ shed for you amen sing this chorus together real quick as we close out this time. My chains are gone I've been set free My God my Savior has ransomed me and like a fly His mercy reigns unending love Unending love, amazing grace. So Father, we thank you for that, that we can come before you, that we can honor the gift that you've given us through the death of your son. And I pray that this morning that we would have hearts to hear what you say to us so we can become more like him. In your name, amen.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Gary Rideout, the other half of the co-senior pastors at this church with one of my wife. And we're excited that you're here today to worship with us, that you're worshiping at home with us, that we've gathered in this spot. And truly excited that we're embarking on this season of Lent. The Lent is the 40 days before Easter Sunday uh, on, to read the Gospel of Luke, to study the Gospel of Luke together. Luke is, uh, is, I shouldn't say this, but Luke is probably my favorite gospel of all of them uh, in the Bible. So... And what makes us even more exciting, we're doing this together. We're doing this as, as, as a church. We're stepping through a chapter at a time and to do that, and, and so that we can know Christ more intimately and richer to strengthen our faith and, and to uh, deepen our faith in him. And it's exciting that we read this one particular gospel, the gospel of Luke, on this Lenten journey. Because it was written by somebody who was educated, a good writer, Luke. He's a great storyteller, and it's very rich with illustrations and a vibrant writing style. If you look at Luke's gospel, you'll see that Luke has this distinctive gift or talent for capturing personalities, for capturing the essence of individuals, of distinctive people in the events of Jesus' earthly life here on, uh, in this lifetime. But, you know, many of the most memorable individuals you think of in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, they were, they were talked about in the gospel of Luke. The Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, Mary and Martha, the rich young ruler, and even the Virgin Mary. There's more written about Mary in the Gospel of Luke than any other Gospels. And that's where we get a rich, deep, rich, deep understanding of who Mary is. And it's interesting about Luke's narrative. He kind of has us look behind the scenes because that is where God works, behind the scenes, over in the wings. A place where nobody notices because they're not on center stage. Who in that time in the world was on center stage? Caesar Augustus, King Herod. Uh, but Luke says, don't look up there. Look over here in the corner. Look at these ragtag shepherds. Look, keeping watch over their flocks at night. These are the ones that the angel of the Lord appeared to to tell them about the coming of Jesus Christ, the great good news of great joy. Luke wants us to respond to the poor and the neglected ones. The ones who had no ladder to climb, no, had no titles to be held. And Luke's gospel is just filled with people, individuals, people on the periphery of life, not too important, not too significant. People that many would say they're not even worth the ink and papyrus that was used on them. The gospel begins with the story of an elderly, elderly married couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, ever so obscure, except that Zechariah was a priest. Our glimpse into their lives starts with Zechariah performing his customary priestly duties. Priests back in those days, they, take, they took turns. There were many priests, so they took turns doing the duties uh, in the temple, and it was Zechariah's turn. When it came to the usual time for him to burn the incense, voila, an angel appeared. That's not supposed to happen. Let's read what happens in the passage for today, Luke 1, 13 through 17. But the angel said to him, and do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this appearance by an angel, it, it, which you find out his, later his name is Gabriel, it's remarkable, remarkable in many ways. And one way is remarkable is because within the historical context of the whole story, the whole Bible narrative, you see, there's a span of 400 years between the end of the events of the Old Testament, about 430 B.C., to the beginning of the events in the New Testament, about 5 B.C., of which the story of Zechariah is one of the first in the New Testament. You know, there are many things that happened in the world during that time, during those 400 years. Uh, but bi biblical record during this time, there's no biblical record. It's as if God was silent for this time. In fact, many biblical scholars call this the 400 years of silence. 
put that in perspective that this great nation of ours has only been existing for 250 years. This is 400 years of silence. We, we, we know, you know, s since no biblical records were preserved, we don't know what was happening with the people of faith during that time. We do not know, we do know that they continue to wait, to wait for this Messiah that the, prom the prophets in the Old Testament promised. And that the people, people had watched and the, uh, because of the, they, they watched the great political glory days of King David and King Solomon, it slowly faded into oblivion. They recall the stories of when they were political and power, respected power in the land. They watched as kingdom after kingdom overpowers them and practically destroys the nation of Israel. And then eventually the Roman Empire becomes into power of the land and the Israelites become their unwilling subjects. They live in oppression and then they're terrible rulers, yet there is hope. Prophets wrote of these times to come that there is hope. A Messiah will, will arrive to save them, not in the way that they thought it would happen, but eventually he will come as a Messiah as they live, they wait in quiet desperation, will not bring a political or military might, but one that will bring a different kingdom, one based on loving one another, even loving your enemies, one that will bring salvation to them through forgiveness, and through mercy. But when, oh God, when? We're suffering. We're in distress. Why do you appear so silent? What are you doing up there, God? It's been 400 years. This cry for relief is kind of echoed in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, too. They so desire a child. Both are up there in age, and their time's running out. Elizabeth is barren. In those days, having no children was, was a the great dishonor, a mark of shame. They were humiliated. It was their greatest wish in life to have a child, to carry on that lineage and carry on their legacy. I wonder how many times Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed to God for a child. The incense that, that Zechariah burnt in that story was represented the prayers of the people going up to God, and I'm sure many of those prayers were for a child from Elizabeth and Zechariah. Why do you, God, appear to be so silent? What are you doing up there, God? Why are you not doing anything? Have you ever been in a situation where you felt God appeared to be silent, not answering your prayers? Or you wonder if your prayers were even heard? We could all probably say that one time or another, that it appears that God is not responding to what we cry, what we pray. What are you doing, God? Some may wonder during these times if there really is a God. And if there is a God, why is God not responding? For the Hebrew people, there, there were signs of hope. There were glimpses of hope. Prophet Isaiah in chapter 11 talks about the shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse and a branch will sprout from the roots. The Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding. The prophet Micah also says in Micah chapter 5 verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from one, from, from me one will that will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old from ancient times. Here you see echoes of hope in this Old Testament. Promises to, to proclaimed. But then 400 years and nothing. No response. So what are the last written words in the Old Testament? Anybody know the last book in the Old Testament? Extra credit point? Malachi, right. I don't think anybody said that, but I'll just pretend somebody said that. Malachi. The last words of Malachi share another echo of hope to the nation of Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and, and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents. God has not forgotten the promise of a Savior, one who would deliver them, from, from, uh, deliver them with love, mercy, and forgiveness. And just when we thought God had maybe forgot about it, or maybe we'd given up on the promise. Boom, angel Gabriel appears. Talk to Zechariah. He tells the priest, uh, the priest Zechariah, that he and Elizabeth will bear a son, even their advanced ages. That's unbelievable. How can that happen? And the child will go before the people to tell them of the coming of Christ, the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for with great expectation. He will be called John, known later as John the Baptist. 
and he will arrive in the spirit of the prophet Elijah to announce the coming of the one that is expected by all and had been promised. And what words did Gabriel use to tell Zechariah about the, the, the birth of his child? It's in Luke. Well, let's look at Luke 1.17 that we read earlier today. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Almost word for word what was written in the last verses of Malachi in the Old Testament. The last thing we hear in the Old Testament. God had not forgotten it. God was listening to them. God repeated what he had said, Malachi had said. God was working, was active in their lives. Yet the reality is that the Messiah hadn't arrived yet. They're waiting with great expectation. But there's those three little words we read a lot in Scripture. Until the time. Until the time. Our time is not God's time. God's time is perfect. God's promises will be fulfilled in time. But we know waiting is difficult. We can't stand to wait. It's tough. Even when we're waiting expectantly, have expectant hope that something is about to happen as we live out our lives in silence. And sometimes we kind of live it out in quiet desperation to hear a word, whether it be for days, weeks, years, or 400 years. There's a great temptation to take matters into our own hands. And I heard a pastor say that the greatest warning he can give to anyone who is waiting is, do not go outside of God to resolve your issues. Do not go outside of God to resolve your issues. If you do, it may take more time for God to, 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 to undo the message you've made. Wait on the Lord, even if you're hearing silence. Don't think that God is not doing anything. God is still working. God is doing a new thing. God is making a way into the wilderness and streams and the wasteland in a ways that we may not even perceive or understand at this time. But wait on the Lord. The nation of Israel waited through 400 years of hearing nothing. Crickets. Silence. So what can we do while we're waiting? Here are some recommendations of what we can do. First of all, examine your life. Take this time to look, look deep within yourself and examine your life and your life with Jesus Christ. The you know, season of Lent is a good time to do this. We got these 40 days before Easter. Where have I strayed in my Christian walk? What do I need to confess knowing that God freely um, gives us forgiveness? Study the word. Join in, in with the study of Luke that we're going through as a church. Meet with others in a small groups that we're setting up throughout the church. You take this journey with others. Reflect on your life. Take this time when you're waiting to examine your life. Second, accept God's authority. Accepting God's authority also means actively trusting God, realizing God is in control and can be trusted, even through the silence, through the silence. Spend this time instead of complaining that things aren't going your way, but turn it around and focus on God. Use this time as an invitation to worship and praise God instead of complaining. Third, listen to what God is saying. Although God may be seem silent regarding certain specific requests or petitions, remember that God is constantly communicating with us. Maybe we're just not listening, not listening at all. And recognize that silence can be intimate. When you're completely comfortable with somebody in person, it's, it's possible to sit in a room together and not utter a word. Not utter a word. I think guys understand this better than women do. So, we can sit in a room with a bowl of chips and dip, with it, watching a football game on TV, and not say a word to each other. That's an intimate moment for guys. That's we can share intimate moments with each other. In complete silence, and we can do so with God. Fifth, keep talking to God. Just because God seems silent doesn't mean you should doubt God and stop praying. Keep sharing your prayers with God. God is always there. God is always active and working in our lives. Remember that God is always up to something new, even though we may not understand what that is. And I want to tell you a greater truth than that. 
Remember that God is up to something bigger than you. God is up to something bigger than you. Just ask Zechariah and Elizabeth. To them, it was just a desire for a child. But to God, it was the Savior of all humankind. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to go ahead and invite the Tilmoni, um, Tilmoni family to come down. So we've got Janet and um, Adam and Lucy and the kids and Elena and Eric. You going to come down, Mark? You want to? Okay. Christopher, you got a cough. I don't understand. So about a month ago, uh, Janet came to visit me, and she said, um, I've never been baptized. She's been a, a woman of faith for a long time, raised her kids in the faith, but she had never actually been baptized. She says, it's too late. I'm, of course it's not too late. What an honor it is. And so I'm really excited. And she said, I also like to have my grandkids baptized the same day. And um, I was really happy to meet Adam and Lucy, and this is very exciting. But I also want to share something with you. Today is a particularly significant day. A year ago today, um, Janet and, and Mark lost their daughter, Jenny. And so they chose this day as a celebration, but as a memory as well, too, to honor her. So we have lots of family here. I just want you to know this is a significant day in their lives. And we're excited that they're open to the work of grace that God brings to us through baptism. So Gary has some questions now. Now, before we, uh, Jenny, you want to turn around? There you go. Before, uh, before we baptize, we always ask the questions of faith to those who are being baptized. Now, some are too young to answer the questions, like Christopher and Charlotte. So their parents, Adam and Lucy, will answer the questions for them. And of course, Janet can answer the questions for herself. Uh, so I'm going to ask you three questions, the historical questions of the, the, um, uh, the United Methodist Church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. If so, do say, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power of God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. All three of you answered that. Did you? Okay. And uh, the third one for all three of you. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with church, with the church, which Christ has opened to all people of all na ages, nations, and races. If so, say, I do. Okay. You answered for Christopher and Charlotte. So you answered for yourself. So now I'm going to ask Lucy and Adam this question about their children. Will you nurture Charlotte and Christopher in Christ's holy church? that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. And so say, I will. So we are going to begin with Janet, because she's the matriarch of this amazing group of people. Janet Marie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and spirit, you will always be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ as you have for many years. Bless you. Charlotte, you want to be next? Okay. Here we go. It's, it's all right. It's okay. It's a lot of pressure. All right, you sit on the floor and I'll come down to you. There we go. What name is given this beautiful little girl? Charlotte. Charlotte Corrette. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you will always be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. You did really well. I'm all done now. You're all done. little guy he's hiding in the back <laughs> yeah there you go all right 
You want to see the water? You want to touch it? Touch it. You can touch that. It's just water. See? Water. All right? All right. What name is given, Christopher? Christopher James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you will always be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, have a congregational response here to welcome Christopher, Charlotte, and Janet into the life of our church. Let's read this together. With God's help, we will so order our lives at the example of Christ that Christopher and Charlotte, we didn't rename them, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. So we are so excited to be able to welcome Christopher and Charlotte and Janet into the family of God. Will you celebrate with me as well? for staying with us. <laughs> so we're going to also move now into a time of giving. And in the next weeks to come, we're going to take a point of sharing with you different ways in which you can be in ministry or different ways you can serve. And we basically want to highlight one particular ministry today that is sort of a behind-the-scenes ministry. Uh, we wanted to introduce you to our hospitality um, leaders who make sure that each and every Sunday um, we have people who are here to greet, to make you feel welcome, to help you find the restrooms, whatever it is you need, um, that those folks organize teams of people to make sure that if you come on this campus, you feel welcomed. And so I would like to introduce to you our hospitality captains for the 815 service. We have Ron and Linda Grote. For the um, 9.45, we have um, Deborah um, Evans is standing at the back, and she organizes her team for this service. At 11.15, we have Tom France. All four of them faithfully serve, organizing teams of people, and we're just so grateful for that. And I just, we wanted you to be made aware of that. Now, this is a time in this final song where if you would like to respond to the word that has been preached, this is a time to give your tithes and offering. And if you're in the building here, uh, we have baskets at the front and then baskets at the back, and you literally get up and you can move um, and put your, your offering in. We always have four ways that you can give online as well. So if you are at home, there's a way to respond. And, of course, for many of you, you prefer to do that just in general. But we want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Know also during the song, if you just feel the need to come and kneel at the altars, it's an appropriate song to do that as well. Um, so let's continue our, in our final song. I searched the world, but he couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade. Never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Hearing your love
show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you see them all you still call me free cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy stand up with us we're gonna close out by singing this chorus together and what I love about this song is it talks about the transformation that God can do in our lives that he takes something and redeems it right? I think of that part where it says you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes I think maybe if we were saying it to well this was written today but if we were putting it in today's terms you know you think about going into like a thrift store or a, pawn, a thrift store or a pawn shop or something like that except it doesn't really lyrically fit really well to be like you take the junk I find in the corner and turn it into something really cool. <laughs> you know, so we say, <laughs> we say these things that sound more poetic, but that's basically what we're saying is he takes the wreck that our lives can be at times and he can transform it into something beautiful. So let's sing this uh, chorus together before we leave this morning. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than much for joining us whether it was here in person or online i just want to say again that you're always welcome here at saint andrews and i pray that you all have a good week